for it. Here we go. All righty. Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Sunday School on Thursday nights. We're continuing on in uh, studying the lessons of Paul. And in just a minute, we're going to turn it over to our sage on the stage, Albert. <laughs> and uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll pray first. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening, Lord, for your goodness, your graciousness, and your gospel, Lord. Thank you that we can meet together via Zoom or however. We just pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to what you would have to say to us and help us to be open to what others have to say during this lesson tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Albert, it's all yours, brother. All right. Thank you, Harv. And uh, good evening again to everybody, if I haven't said hello already. Um, wanted to read uh, something to you that's in, in the teacher's book here. And it's just kind of a reminder. I, I think it might be redundant. I hope everybody knows this already, but but just in, in case anybody feels a little hesitant in, in speaking up or or that this is a top-down sort of class, it isn't. Um, but there's a section called Tips for Teachers in, in, in our books. And um, every every week it has you know some little tip. I, I don't necessarily share them all because um, it's not necessarily worth sharing, but I thought this one was interesting. It says, um, some teachers feel that their primary function is to convey information. If that is a, your idea of a Sunday school teacher, you'll likely meet stress in a couple of places. First, you'll feel like you need to have all the answers and none of us do. Second, your class will likely feel frustrated because they are adults who have life experiences and lessons to share as well. So what is your role as an adult Sunday school teacher? Modern teaching theory says that the teacher should be a guide on the side instead of a sage on the stage. That's where Harvard has that expression. Your role will depend on your personality and abilities. And then the author says, when I teach, my number one goal is to make people think for themselves. So I just wanted to share that with you because I hope you all know uh, that this isn't some kind of class you know, for one person, whether it be me or one other person, or even Harvey as the pastor to just, you know, sit and give founts of wisdom here. It's an, it's interactive and really it works best, I believe, when, when everybody participates. Uh, for me personally, the less I have to say, the better. Um, and For me and too. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, please, participate that's what it's all about and I like that line where it said um, this is true your class might feel frustrated because they are adults who have life experiences and lessons to share as well we all do and so you know please feel free to do that as we continue our study again I hope you know that I think you know that by now but just in case I wanted to throw it out as a reminder so we will continue now with the life of Paul. Tonight's title is called Going with the Gospel, and it's from Acts 13, the first part of Acts 13. Um, and in the need section, it says, what is God's purpose for my life? God's purpose is the calling. The calling is revealed in a step-by-step -step process of following the prompting of the Holy Spirit. The calling may be simple, like pray for your friend. Over years, listening to the Holy Spirit, I have learned that the quiet voice of what I first believed to be a random thought was the Holy Spirit impressing me to pray for that individual or situation. Once the Holy Spirit impresses you, he continues to nudge you in love until the calling is complete. In prayer, when peace of heart replaces the burden, we can be reassured that God has heard and is answering prayer. At that time, the prayer warrior can have assurance and state, I have prayed through on this matter. And in the story, it says, the section, it says, Barnabas and Saul were worshiping and fasting with a group of believers in Antioch. The Holy Spirit spoke as clear as in a conversation between friends. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. This became their first missionary journey. First, harmony was orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. God's plan brings unity. Second, the conductor, named the Holy Spirit, knew who was needed to make the, knew who was needed to make the journey. Part of the Holy Spirit's job is to coordinate talents and abilities of individuals and sometimes oddities and peculiarities to accomplish God's work. Even in retrospect, we can be amazed at whom the Holy Spirit directed to fulfill a particular part. And in parentheses, it says, in heavenly music, it is like a piccolo playing softly after the loudest part of the music. 
Third, the group followed the leadership of the Spirit. The critical task of the believer is to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And finally, the Holy Spirit continued to coordinate the events of the mission of the missionary journey as well as events after the journey. So a little uh, background into what we're going to study tonight. And, and I would encourage you, we talked last week about um, the book of Acts. Uh, last week we were in, in chapter nine with Saul's conversion. And in the intervening chapters, you might want to take some time during your daily Bible reading to read the intervening verses. Um, and in chapter 10, you have Cornelius and Peter's visions um, where they come to God, together, where God works uh, to tell Peter that the, the gospel is not just for the Jews only, but, but for the Gentiles also. Um, and then Peter goes to Jerusalem and reports what he saw. And then it, um, in chapter 11, talks about the church at Antioch. And you may remember that the church at Antioch is where Jesus' followers were first called Christians. And you'll find that in chapter 11. And then Peter gets arrested, and then miraculously God gets him out of jail. And I, I always laugh at the section when he gets out of jail, and, and it says how they were all praying for him. And he stands at the door, and he knocks, and a girl named Rhoda comes to the gate and recognizes his voice and leaves him standing there and runs in to tell everybody. And then they say, what are you talking about? He can't be out here, even though they've been praying so hard for him. And here he is, and yet it's still hard to believe that he had got out of jail. So <laughs> it, it's, some, it's some really good stuff um, in be, between 9 and where we left off last week and 13. So I encourage you to read that. But we get now to 13, and as our notes tell us, it's the beginning of the first missionary journey. So, Harv, you want to have somebody read that? Let's do that. Right now. I'm going to take a spotlight off of you, Albert, and I'm going to share the screen. Hopefully, I'll do this right. Does that look right? You guys can see that? Yeah, we can see something. Uh-oh, something? Well, we can see some writing. About now. Yeah, there you go. Okay, good. All right, I just have to adjust the uh, gallery view of everybody so that I can see who's here and who's not and talk to you. Hold on. We need a really big so, screen. Okay. So for the first verse, pick somebody who wants to be challenged with all these names. Oh, yeah. Oh, good, good call. <laughs> hmm. Who would like to do that? Uh, Larry! <laughs> can you read the first verse for us? <laughs> no. Now there were prophets and teachers at Antioch in the church that was there, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, who had been brought up with the with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Well done. Very good. Since <laughs> since the Holy Spirit named certain men of importance in the church at Antioch, it may be beneficial to consider each one. Barnabas, the son of consolation, a Jew from Cyprus, was listed first. He appears to have been the pastor of the church following his commission in Acts 11:22. The next man listed is called by two names. Simeon was a common name, so he was distinguished by the name Niger. Niger means black. Since he is listed with Lucius from Cyrene, which is in northern Africa, we may assume that he was a black man who had become a Jewish proselyte. Some would conjecture that this might be the same as Simon of Cyrene who carried Jesus' cross. That's in Matthew. Whether that is true or not, the important thing for us to notice is that the church was not prejudiced toward nationalities, races, races, or colors. Lucius of Cyrene was possibly another black man. Menaean is the Greek form of the Hebrew word for comforter. Luke tells us that he had been brought up with Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea. He was the foster brother of Herod, and thus was a person of influence and royal descent. Saul was a Roman Jew from Tarsus who was the intellectual of the group. Thus, in the unity of the church, we see people from varied races or backgrounds and with differing degrees of education and influence. The beauty of this is that they were one in spirit and in purpose. Jesus Christ was the unifying person in the church. Yeah, Luke gives a lot of detail there, doesn't he? Okay. Yeah. All right, let's yeah, go to verse does. two. Uh, Margarito, please. Verse two, welcome. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. 
Several things of importance need to be noticed. First, the people of God were involved in worship and fasting when they received direction for God's work. Second, the Holy Spirit had already called Barnabas and Saul to be missionaries before he announced it to the church. Third, the men waited for the sanction of the church before they went out to do the work God called them to do. Fourth, the Holy Spirit spoke to the church about his will. And fifth, the church was sensitive to the direction of the Spirit. Sixth, they were unselfish in sending forth two important men from their church, one of whom was probably the pastor. And three. And three. Uh, how about Brother Al? Could you read three for us, please? Uh, there we go. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Oops. By laying hands on the men after they had fasted and prayed about the matter, the church was saying several things. They were stating by this action that, that they as a group understood that this was the work of God. Furthermore, they were stating that since this was the work of God, they as a unit would support that work. When the church ordains a person to ministry, it takes upon itself a responsibility of support. The support of finances, prayer, and confidence are all a work of the church for those in ministry. Hmm. And, and four verse four noel please so being sent out by the holy spirit they went down to seleucia and from there they sailed to cyprus these two men were sent by the holy spirit and sanctioned by the church they were to receive their authority from the holy spirit not from the church since the holy spirit involved the church in the process of sending out the church was obligated to support the ministers the ministers, in turn, were obligated to serve the church. They were to take care of these obligations as they were directed by the Holy Spirit. Seleucia was located on the Orontes River near the Mediterranean Sea. It was a short distance from the mountainous area of Antioch. Across the sea, the coastline and mountains of Cyprus could be seen on a clear day. Cyprus was a Roman province that was famous for its copper mines and shipbuilding industry. It was sometimes called the Happy Isle because of its pleasing climate. All right. So, thoughts, comments. And that box uh, where, where the need is at, it had a little question there. It says, how do you know the Holy Spirit is talking to you? And, you know, I, I think most of the time, uh, I believe I, I listen to him after the fact, you know, never during never during the time you know like i just wake up and realize you know what I, I i walked into a situation where you know what uh i didn't know better but but the holy spirit was looking out for me and, and you know got me to these circumstances and whatever whatever they were you know whether it's just being at a church or uh friends with somebody you know uh, running into a stranger or whatever you know but uh you know i I've been told, you know, prayed for God to put people in your path and stuff like that. And I, maybe I don't do that as often, but uh, I, I try to, you know, invoke that, 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 uh, I try to invoke that invitation of the Holy Spirit to me to, you know, get me around it, especially because uh, I, I don't know, I don't know enough. I don't know. I'm not, you know. Don't leave me by myself. <laughs> Don't leave me to my own device. <laughs> so, so you're saying that that um, wh while you pray, the Holy Spirit would speak to you, but you may not have recognized it until after the fact. Yeah, exa exactly. I mean, you know, I'm 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 asking him. Uh, you know, say, you know, hey, you know, I'll let me be in your will, Lord. Uh, uh, you know, but um, a lot of times I, I go about, you know, I mean, because I know people that stop and pray for just about. Uh, everything you know uh, uh that isn't my approach uh but uh certainly uh you want to know you're in god's will you know you say, oh man you know i don't know how i got here but man god was looking out for me you know uh, you yeah. know and then 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 let me stumble into the wrong place you know i didn't i didn't knock on I didn't open the door to that Jehovah Witness and let him entertain me and, and and draw me in. 
while I know now, you know, that's not the way to go. Uh, uh, I may not have been as savvy back then, but, you know, uh, I certainly knew something was wrong, you know, uh, about that, you know. Uh, I don't know why I wound up in a Baptist church, but I knew uh, I knew the Catholic church was not for me, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you take on a little bit, uh, you listen to a little bit of the Holy Spirit, but eventually it, 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 uh, it'll get you where you're going, you know. Uh, if you yield just a little bit, he'll work with that, you know. I believe that. Al, I dare say what you say is, is commonplace among, among Christians and, and among praying people that, you know, we don't always recognize something until after until after it's passed and then you see God's hand it's more clear to us to see God's hand in it I, I'll refer back to what I referred to before uh, our lesson started in Acts when Peter got out of jail when God delivered him out of jail and he comes back to the house and they were all praying for him and yet when he gets there they can't believe it <laughs> so I mean we have faith but but when something happens it's hard to see it right away and you know it it, 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 the guy got to be, you know, slapped in the face or, or, you know, time, you know, helps us to realize it. it it's, it's kind of strange. That what, is, what is it the, uh, what is it the, the man said to Jesus, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Uh, and, and I think of that often because, I, you know, I think we all have faith, but there's things that are just sometimes hard to, hard to grasp for us. Well, and I think sometimes it's like, God, I know you could do this, but why would you do it for me? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, you got bigger things on your plate than my little problems. <laughs> well, oh, I mean, we, I think I feel that way sometimes. But yeah. I think it's important to see that they were praying and fasting. Yeah. yeah. I've never fasted except for my colonoscopy. You know, be honest with you about <laughs> that, right? Uh, uh, yeah. uh, but I, and, and I'll be honest with you, I, my prayers, even though I'm a pastor, I probably should be more deep in prayer, but my prayers are kind of like, Hey God, let me do your will. And, and and that's it. You know, maybe, maybe this week I'm going to challenge myself to spend five good minutes in prayer with the Lord each day of this week. And then maybe I can add to that next week, you know, but, uh, cause you know, I'll be honest, my prayers are kind of like superficial right now. I'm just being honest with everybody. Well, so, yeah. Well, and, and yeah. God knows our, God, you know, to that point, God, God knows our heart. You know, it's interesting you say about prayers. I mean, some of the greatest prayer warriors, uh, people who are at least publicly when they pray, aren't necessarily the most articulate people that you've ever met or the ones that, uh, that you would think would be that, that good in prayer, that that's a good word to use. But again, you know, if you pray sincerely, uh, and, and, you know, I mean, sometimes I guess maybe we all say a prayer kind of quickly, um, not as deep as you'd like, but, but I think God hears us, you know, when we come to him, honestly, and forthrightly, and, and, and whether it's the, the most eloquent, or, or deepest, or, or whatever, if it's from the heart, and we're speaking honestly with him, that's what I think is the most important, though, um, you know, the, the fervency, I guess you'd say. This is true, but and to be clear about this, it's not that I need to pray more to gain more favor with God. It's I need to pray more to understand God better, as like okay. a quiet, yeah. time, like a quiet time, you know. Yeah, a time of prayer and meditation. So, uh, so yeah, I think I'll, I'll try. I'll try more of that this. And last thing I want to say about this part, and then we can move on or whatever. But uh, Mrs. Kruver used to always say. Lord, let us be a blessing to somebody today. Put somebody in yeah. our path that would we would be a blessing to. So yeah. I was looking for this the Holy Spirit working. I just real quick. I was just looking for this verse because this kind of reminded me of Jacob, uh, and uh, and and he awakes from his sleep and said, "Surely the Lord was the Lord is in this place," and I knew it not. You know, mm-hmm. and that's kind of how it is. You know what I mean? I. Uh, it's hard to know when you're in the zone, you know, like, like they say in sports, you know, and all of a sudden you, man, you, 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 
dude, how'd you do that? I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I can't, I can't explain it, but here I am, you know. Uh, yeah. And that's, how, that's how it is, I think, with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes <laughs> you don't even know that you're in the midst of, of his will. But uh, but he's taking, like I said, that little bit that you ask for or, or you lean towards and, and 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 takes you farther than than you can in your own spirit. Uh, he, what is this? Uh, he, he he utters prayer. The, the Holy Spirit prays for us, you know, things that we don't we can't pray for ourselves, you know, right. for us, you know. So we don't can't we can't give ourselves almost no credit at all for for what we get from the Holy Spirit because or from God rather I should say because the Holy Spirit is actually the one that does the whole mess of praying for us you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah I just I just have another comment and please if somebody else has something please jump in but it's it's shifting gears a little bit and it's not as deep as what we've been talking about. But that first verse that we read about the different people in the church, I, I, when I studied this lesson last night, it struck me, the notes really struck me here. Because to be honest, that first verse, normally when I'm reading it, is one that you kind of will glance over. It mentions all these people, frankly, most of whom I haven't heard about. I've heard of Barnabas and Saul, um, and, you know, and we'll hear more about them as we, as we go on. But the others I really hadn't heard about, never paid much attention to. And, and I thought our notes really brought out some, some good points about who these people were, what their backgrounds were, um, you know, coming from different areas, different status in society, uh, different races and nationalities. And, and, it, and the notes point this out. It really is a picture of the church, isn't it? You know, especially spreading it now to, to the Gentiles. It's to everybody. And, and, and it's universal. And, and I, that really struck me. And I hadn't thought of that that much. Usually, as I say, when I come across these kind of verses, you know, I go to the next one to get to the main part of the story, because that's not the main part of the story. But I think it's a good point. I'm glad they brought it out. No, I, I put a little asterisk after the end of that, uh, after the, uh, the author's notes there, too. Uh, I thought that was pretty fast. I thought that was a little fascinating, the, the insight he gives to that uh, first yeah. verse. Yeah, that was, that was really great. Uh, I I didn't know that either. Yeah, if I knew it, I don't. I didn't know I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot you knew it. Okay. All right. Break. <laughs> so here they are. They're set aside. The Holy Spirit comes and says, "These are the two that uh, need to go do this work," and uh, the church supports it, lays hands on them, and off they go. We're to verse five. Okay, and uh, this to show you guys quickly. Oh, here thank you. Are, yeah, they're starting off in, uh, let me annotate here, Antioch, and they go to Cilicia. They're going to sail now to Cyprus and Salamis is where we're at now. Okay. So, so modern day, where is this? Is it, this is, Antioch is, is that like above Israel? Uh, well, there's Jerusalem <laughs> down here. <laughs> Turkey. It's Turkey. So tur it's Turkey. Okay. That's what I say. I know some of these towns are in Turkey, but I, I didn't get out my map and I'm not as good on the geography part of it here. So yeah. Okay. Yep. Just thought I'd share that. Okay. So let me good. I'm glad you did that. the drawings here and we'll change the sharing. Wait a minute. I think I know how to do this. New share and the share will be this. And it is my bride's turn to read, please. When they reached Thalamus, they began to proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John as their helper. Thalamus was a harbor town on the east coast of Cyprus. It was a trading center, which was the home of a large number of Jews. When the new missionaries arrived in this port town, the Jews readily welcomed them into their synagogue, where they preached the gospel from the Old Testament. John Mark accompanied them on this tour as their minister. The word which Luke chose to describe John, John Mark's duties, literally means that he was an underling. And yeah. so, he's he's so, about to, about to uh, disappear from the scene for a little bit, but he's here now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. Whose turn is it now? I, uh, I think it's my turn, right? Do we have more people that showed up? Everybody's read at least once, right? 
Okay. So when they had gone through the whole island as far as Pathos, they found a magician, ooh, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar Jesus. After traveling about a hundred miles, the missionaries came to the city of Paphos on the west coast of the island. The city had been destroyed by earthquake in 15 BC, but soon was rebuilt by the Roman government. Now it was known for its beautiful buildings and a temple dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite. Here the people worshiped Venus, the goddess of love. This city was the administrative and religious center of the island. The Roman proconsul Sergius Paulus resided there. In Paphos, the missionaries happened on a Jewish false prophet by the name of Bar Jesus, or son of Joshua, who dabbled in magic. He probably, inter he probably interpreted dreams and practiced in the occult to, to benefit his superstitious employer, the Roman proconsul. Okay. In verse 7, uh, let's see, Margarita, please. It was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. Yeah, and the, and, uh, the New American Standard calls him a man of intelligence. And our notes say the Roman proconsul Sergius Paulus was an intelligent man, says the same thing. He did not believe in the one God of the Jews, but he desired to hear what the missionaries had to say. And eight. Okay, verse eight, Larry, please. But Elimas, the magician, for so his name is translated, was opposing them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Elimas is the Greek for magician and was the name by which the false prophet was known. The false prophet act, actively opposed the witness of the missionaries for at least two reasons. As a Jew, he was bitterly opposed to the message of the gospel, even though he was not serving God. In addition, he knew that if the missionaries were able to convince Sergius Paulus to accept Christ, his job as magician for the proconsul would be terminated. <laughs> I need you all to know that it's not the kind of magic I do, okay? Just, uh, <laughs> right. Okay, Al, could you read verse uh, 9, please? Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set, uh, set his eyes on him. This is the first time the name Paul occurs and the last time in which this apostle is called Saul as his common as his common or general name. From this time, Saul was known as Paul. Here, the scripture confirms that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and 10. Verse 10, Noel, please. And said... You who are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not stop making crooked the straight ways of the Lord? Um, subtlety, I think, I think that's a word used in the King James here. It says uh, deceit, pretending to supernatural powers without possessing any and having only cunning and deceit as their substitutes. Mischief is often employed to signify an abandoned and accomplished villain. Child of the devil means possessing his nature, filled with his cunning, and in consequence, practicing deceit. Enemy of all righteousness. Opposed in thy heart all that is just, true, and good. Will thou not cease to pervert? Um, and again, says, will you not stop making crooked the straight ways of the Lord? He had probably labored in this bad work from the beginning of Paul's ministry in the place. And God in his mercy had borne with him. And no doubt the apostle had warned him, for thus much seems implied in the reproof. What a terrible character is given of this bad man. What is here said of the conduct and teaching of Elimus, for he was a false prophet, is true of all false doctrine. It is complex, devious, and tortuous. While the doctrine of God is simple, plain, and straight, directing in the way, the sure way that leads to present peace and everlasting happiness. And 11. Boy, that was a lot to read there. Okay, Jen, <laughs> could you read verse 11 for us, please? Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and not see the sun for a time. And immediately a mist and a darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking those who would lead him by the hand. The power of God is now about to deal with thee in the way of justice. 
and 12. In verse 12, I will read that. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had happened, being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. When God's power is exercised, his people speak the gospel with authority. Sin rebuke, and people turn to God. All right, thoughts, comments. So here we have uh, Barnabas and Paul being sent off by the church. They, they cross over and go to Cyprus. And they, they start by, by preaching to the Jews, um, which, is, which is the pattern that Paul follows almost, almost all the time. And um, they run across this false prophet, magician. Uh, he's given several different names. And, and he's, trying to, he's trying to get rid of the, the missionaries because his boss, the uh, Roman proconsul, um, you know, is actually paying attention and listening. And our notes say, well, for a couple of reasons. First, he was opposed to their teaching just in general. And second, because it was going to cost him his job. And, and boy, Paul really lets him have it, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, and it says he was a Jew, but he wasn't really a, a Jewish believer in Judaism. No. He was born Jewish, but he wasn't Hebrew. Or he was born Hebrew, but he wasn't practicing the Jewish faith because he would have been stoned to death. In Jerusalem, if he tried that stuff, right, right, he'd get away with it in the uh, Gentile world. Yeah, yeah. And this proconsul was he a Roman then? Yeah, he. I presume he was the Roman proconsul. Right. So I, I assume that that God decided to use, quote unquote, a miracle to win this guy over, rather than the Jewish scripture, because he didn't believe the Jewish scripture anyway. Yeah, God in God in his timing allowed this magician to, you know, go about his, his you know, his craft, uh, awaiting the, the time to uh to present uh, you know his fate to you know to bring about you know the the conversion I guess of this proconsul, you know. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that yeah. was uh that was God's. That was God's timing and all and all of that. So, so if this was God's timing um, and you know a way to convert the pro council, then does the magician does he bear responsibility for what he did? Well, people are always asking that foolish question: Why does God allow this and that and this? <laughs> it, it's his purpose, you know. It's it's his show, you know. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's history, not my story. Not my story. It's his story. <laughs> well, yeah, the Bible tells us, you know, that God's will will be done. And I, I'm not quoting exactly, but, but um, you know, for some of the bad things that happen, woe unto them by whom it comes. So we are responsible. I, yeah. I mean, you know, God, you know, obviously has his plans and, and things that he wants to, to have done. But, but if we try to stand in the way of that, that's on us. If, you know, like you say, it's his show and, and he gives it, but he still gives us the free will to choose what we're going to do. And clearly this guy, you know, for his own reasons, didn't want, <clears throat> didn't want the gospel to be spread here. Um, so it's, it's on him. It's, you know, some people, some people will say, well, no, it's on God because he was going to have, he was going to let Paul succeed and, and have the Roman proconsul be saved. But no, it's it's on Elimus or Bar Jesus or whatever name you want to give to him. He had his yeah. choice to make as well. I, so, I got to wonder if Paul chuckled a little bit when this guy lost his sight and was led by the hand. Like, oh, that's what I look like, huh? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what happened to him? Paul saw... Where have I, where Paul have I saw seen this? Yeah, Paul saw pure light, but this guy got darkness. Yeah. Because he was in the dark arts, I think. So uh, but that's my speculation. I don't know why God did it that way. But, but Paul must have been chuckling going, okay, so yeah, now I, now I get it. Because he, you know, this guy was also an important man in his area. I, I like the verse that it says he fixed his gaze on him. Um, yeah, I, I guess nowadays would say he gave him a dirty look, but the, this was more than a dirty <laughs> look, I think. <laughs> and and then 
<laughs> what he says to him, you are full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to make crooked the straight ways of the Lord? You know, nowadays, I suppose, when people get mad, especially non, non uh, religious people, you know, they'll swear at someone and call them all these awful names. Well, son of the devil is right up there. It's, <laughs> it's not yeah. a curse word, but son of the devil is pretty bad. Paul was not, and, and got, the Holy Spirit was not pleased with this guy at all. And you know, paid the price. The, the, the Bible was the first place where you find that that evil word, uh, the SOB, is in there. Sons of Baal. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, there is an SOB. Yeah, that's right. The Sons of Baal. It's Sons pretty much Baal. Paul. That's what Paul's calling him here, you know. <laughs> This is cursing, uh, <laughs> Christian cursing, I guess. <laughs> he let that guy have it, boy, with all, with all barrels really there. Did. Let me read to you uh, so, some notes here um, on, on these verses that we just read. It says, in Luke 24, 49, there was a command to the disciples, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. We know that promise was fulfilled at Pentecost with the supernatural boldness of spreading the message of Jesus Christ. Saul, Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit in, at his conversion. He was empowered by the Spirit to go and preach boldly at all times, even in the face of evil spirits. On the missionary journey, they continued to have the empowering of the Spirit. This empowering of the Holy Spirit was manifested by multiple exclamation marks along their journey. These were the items added by the Holy Spirit to the journey that helped others to catch the faith. The Jewish sorcerer Alimus's blindness, the proconsul conversion, providing opportunities to speak in the Basidian synagogue, the application of the message to the heart of the people, further invitations to speak. The empowerment of the Holy Spirit went on and on. Any other thoughts or comments before we read the last verse here in our lesson tonight? Uh, yeah, I'm going to backtrack on what I said about him not believing the teachings because I, I didn't realize I forgot that about that. He says he says being amazed at the teaching of the Lord. So after he saw the miracle, then it was actually the word of the Lord that came to him and changed. Him. Oh, okay. So I'm backtracking on that. I'm not. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah. Um, okay. But, you know. So God's God's word is very very powerful here too, whether whether he would have saw the miracle or not, teaching the doctrine of the Lord is what saved him. I think the miracle had, had a big was a big impetus. Though. Oh, I'm sure it did. Yeah, <laughs> but that didn't save him. No. Yeah. No. no. It's the okay. teaching, you know, what Jesus did for him. All right. Cool. Very good. Well, we have one more, one more verse here, verse 13. One more verse. Okay, Larry, would you, uh, wait a minute, before we do that. No, no, verse 13. Well, yeah, okay. Let's uh, share the screen again. As I stop sharing the screen. There we go. And Larry, would you read the last verse for us, please? Now, Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. After the missionaries had evangelized the island of Cyprus, which was Barnabas's home, they boarded ship to sail to Asia Minor, where Paul had been raised. John Mark, who did not enjoy the rigors of the minister's life, decided to return to his home in Jerusalem. Even in the midst of spiritual victory, there are always some who only see the fierce opposition of the enemy. The spiritual battlefield is often where people determine how serious they are about serving God. Okay, thoughts, comments? There we are, right there. So who was who John Mark? Uh, John Mark was part of the early church. He's, uh, the Bible scholars say he's the Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Yeah. Okay, I was, wasn't sure if he was John, if he was Mark. Or... <laughs> There's also... 
these people having all these names. <laughs> yeah, there's also good indication that he was the uh, the guy that left his cloak behind after the resurrection when he ran mm -hmm. ran away. Or was it? no, not, no, the crucifixion when he got a, he tried to get away. I'm gonna mm -hmm. look that up now. Keep talking, guys. <laughs> that was Peter's Peter's scribe mark. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So the other thoughts or questions or comments here. So our lesson ends here tonight, but their journey continues on uh, to Asia Minor. And you can read more about it. Um, our our lesson next week picks up in Acts 14a, but you can read you can read some of it. Um, you know, some of the rest of the journey here uh, in your own reading. Uh, it's interesting, though, uh, that last verse there about John departing from them. Uh, Paul wasn't too happy about this. It's not here, but later in Acts, you'll read, read about it, that Paul wasn't real happy about John Mark's leaving. And our notes kind of imply, I mean, they say even in the midst of spiritual victory, there are always some who only see the fierce opposition of the enemy. I, it seems to me that comment is kind of, geared toward John Mark kind of negatively. I, I don't know. I, 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 you know, like I said, I know Paul wasn't too happy about it. Um, and I don't know. And there's a number of reasons that, that, that scholars speculate why he left. Um, but, but nevertheless, he was an important leader in the church too. And we have the gospel of Mark from him. So obviously God had to work for him as well. So before I criticize him too harshly, uh, you know, he did fulfill, he certainly fulfilled an important role in, in the work of the early church and, and even today, um, you know, because we still have that gospel from him. And I, I believe they had reconciliation towards the end, too. He couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't handle boot camp. Well, possibly. I mean, you think about it, think about a missionary's life. It's not for everybody. And then it doesn't mean that you're not a, uh, you know, a God-fearing Christian doing God's will, but I don't think God has the same plans for all of us. Um, and, and you know, he, that just may not have fit him well. Some suspect that he was closer to Barnabas and when Paul kind of became the leader of the group that maybe he didn't like that. I, I mean, that's possible. I mean, there's several reasons that, that they uh, suspect, but whatever the reason is, I guess my, my point is, um, you know, all these people while, while being, picked by God and, and clearly being led by God, they were also human beings too. And human beings you know, are bound to have conflict from time to time. Um, so yeah, Harvey mentioned they had a, they had a reconciliation or they, uh, later on down the road. I and mean, that, that just happens. That's just part of any, any organization of more than one person. <laughs> you're, bound, <laughs> you're bound to have a disagreement here and there. You know, I think sometimes just people don't flourish in their circumstances and and then they get you know other other people around them different environment and then all of a sudden they you know they they, they blossom you know it's just like uh, right. a, a teacher can say look you know this kid's not cutting it in my class we we've got a strained relationship but uh i think this other teacher can work a lot better with them and right. uh, why don't we uh, why don't we switch it over and all of a sudden boom you know t they take off you know right and, and it does and, and it doesn't mean either one was wrong necessarily they just you know two personalities don't mesh together too well so that's why I say I'm not too harsh on on John Mark whatever his reasons for leaving were um, you know they, they, they could have been completely noble for, for all I know but but nevertheless, he, he did leave at this point. It, it just wasn't for him for whatever reason. Right. And I looked it up. It's Mark 14. After Jesus is arrested, a young man was following him wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body. And they seized him. But he pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked. So they think that was actually Mark, the writer of Mark, John Mark. So Mark, Mark was the first streaker. <laughs> Apparently, yeah. Not intentional. <laughs> <laughs> So, anyway, so all right. So what do, what do we take away from this lesson? I'm gonna try to pray more this week. Okay. I, 
I, I it's just there are there are big big ventures for God, and then and there are seemingly small th- details that we we think God is not interested in, in in including Him to help us with that, and and I think you know it, it, here it shows you know that uh, even simple things can uh, have great consequences uh for the future you know so you know you may not pray specifically in detail for uh, this guidance but hey hey guy wh- whatever my plans are wh- whatever direction i'm taking you know uh I don't, i'm not gonna ask you to every door i touch is this the door to go through you know but uh it, you know what give me the wisdom that uh you know to to know, you know, to know uh, when to grab my experience and, 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 and you know, uh, and, you know, and, and invoke, you know, maybe help at, at, at the moment, if I, you know, but otherwise, you know, let me, let me get through this day, you know, in, in your will, and, you know, and don't let me get, don't let me get far away, you know, from you, you know, and I think that's pretty much a lot how, we do we do pray you know you know god i yeah i need your help today we're not specific but you know what um but we do want uh we do want to get nudged by him definitely you know and uh you know i i i just can't pray enough yeah <laughs> good point our 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 title is going with the gospel and this is a good example of um you know, the early church and, you know, part of how it spread. Actually, the church at Antioch itself um, was established because Christians in Jerusalem, because of the persecution, were scattering to the surrounding areas. And some of them ended up there in Antioch. And we believe Barnabas was the head, you know, was the pastor there. And, um, and, and of course, you remember Barnabas is the one who kind of, after Saul's conversion, after Paul's conversion, um, introduced him to the other church members because they were all afraid of him and didn't trust him. And, and so they, you know, had a bond. But the church in Antioch um, was these scattered Christians who had moved up there, and they obviously had a very active um, and spirit-filled church going on there. This is where the, the first missionary journey took off from. And, and I think it's impressive to see how and our notes pointed it out, um, you know, they mentioned all the other, or several other people in the church, and how the Holy Spirit spoke to them, and they sent them, they sent two of the, two of the leading people in the church, yeah. Barnabas, who was presumably their pastor, and Paul, who was, you know, a great intellect, I mean, he, I, I mean, to even us, to us today as Christians, explains more about Jesus, and, 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 than, than almost anybody, I mean, more so just by volume, if nothing else, but so many intellectual uh, reasons of why we should believe, and, and, and he, was, he was so powerful, and both of those people left that church, so I think it speaks to the people who were left behind, and it speaks to the working of God, with, you know, with God, all things are possible, I know that's cliche, but it's, it's true, and, and so and churches today, that's what they do, don't they? With missionaries, they, they, they bless them and, and put their hands on them and, and should be supporting them and send them on their way. Um, so I, I think it's just a, a great model for churches to follow. And, and, and just in, if we apply it individually to our lives, just you know, keep trusting God and, and, and follow what he wants us to do. And to what you guys were saying, you know, make sure we're praying to stay in his will. Amen. So, um, Al, did you want to read the difference? Okay. Uh, I prayed several years for the salvation of a neighbor and friend. That Wednesday evening, I had gone under the direction of the Holy Spirit to pray with this neighbor and friend who had been diagnosed with lung cancer. He was now terminally ill. I had been impressed in my morning devotion time and throughout the day to talk to him about his relationship with God, he asked, why are you here? I said, to talk to you about getting right with Jesus. He responded, if, that's, if that is why you came, you can leave now. I whispered a quick prayer, what now? The quiet voice said, 
pick up the Kleenex box on the table. As I picked up the box, I noted it was decorated for Christmas. The quiet voice said, ask him if this was a gift from Jesus, would he take it? I repeated the words, if this was a gift from Jesus, would you take it? He melted in tears. Prayer followed. In a few minutes, he was a new child in Christ. Operating under the direction of the Holy Spirit is the best solution for every problem. Wow. Very good. All right. And Dan, point of special interest? What, one more, one more oh, thing sorry. before we get to that. I, um, okay. I just read it. Um, it just says, Henry Blackaby in his fourth reality states, God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. I think they kind of summarize a lot of what we talked about tonight in, in this lesson. Yeah. Okay. Back to the My special interest, then. Ms. Frances Ridley Havergal, soon after she became a Christian, went to a school at Dusseldorf. Her heart was warm with love for her Savior, and she was eager to speak with him, for him. To her dismay, however, she soon discovered that among the hundred girls, she was the only Christian. Her first feeling was that she could not confess Christ in that great company of unchristian companions. Her gentle, sensitive heart shrank from a duty so hard. Her second thought, however, was that she could not refrain from confessing him. I am the only one he has here, she said. And this thought became a source of strength and inspiration. She felt she was Christ's witness in that school, his only witness, and she dare not fail. <laughs> Isn't, didn't she write some songs that we sing? Oh, I don't know. That, that name sounded familiar, but I couldn't think of what, what songs. I can see. I'm not sure. Well, anyway, you gonna look up the songs then? I am. Are you able to do that? Okay, she's looking it up. Francis Ridley Haverball. Take my life and let it be like a river glorious and light after darkness. Oh, no, that's not so Life, let it be. Yeah. Take my life and let it be. Dun, 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 dun. Something consecrated to thee? Is that in there? So. Yes. But I will tell you, she wrote 234 songs. Oh, okay. I saw 234 I, I, more I, than I ever wrote. What, what's that? That's 234 more than I ever wrote. <laughs> <laughs> Proliferate. Yeah. Right. Wow. Pretty amazing. Okay, any last thoughts before we wrap it up? We're almost running out of time here. Well, Albert, thank you for leading us through these lessons with Paul. Well, thank you. Until you're sure. doing your homework, thank you. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna, let's go ahead and close in prayer if nobody has any more comments and then we'll stop the recording. Father, again, we thank you this evening, Lord, for your goodness, your graciousness and your gospel, Lord. Thank you for uh, men and women like Paul the Apostle and uh, Peter Abbott for just being faithful to you and uh, help us, Lord, to be faithful to your word as we come in contact with others throughout our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. I'm gonna stop Thank you. Now. Thank you very much.